Wow, I got to be a little more gentle, I think. Put a crack in the old uh, whatever whatever it is. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Thursday, July 26, 2018 meeting of the uh, Dinah Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Roll call, please, Ms. Ellison. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Staunton. Here. Chair Hovland. Here. Commissioner Brindle. Commissioner Stewart. Here. We have a form of meeting agenda in front of us uh, this morning. Uh, Manager Neal, anything that you want to uh, modify on the agenda? Uh, no, the, the uh, one that was in front of you at the diocese is the updated version. Okay, very good. Is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as shown? So, second. We got a motion and second to approve the meeting agenda as provided. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, opposed? Carried. Um, Community comment. Anyone in the audience who wishes to address the, I, uh, the IRA, the HRA? Everybody's worried about their IRA, the HRA, or the Irish Republican Army, or the individual retirement account, or um, a matter of concern to them. It's not otherwise on the agenda this morning. Seeing no one coming forward, we'll move on to the uh, consent agenda. And um, we have a few items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? Okay, is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Second. We got a motion and second to adopt the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Um, one matter, uh, Manager Neal, with respect to the uh, uh, item C on the consent agenda, the agreement with Stevens Construction Corporation. I was over there yesterday uh, near the senior center and there was absolutely no place for anybody to park on the street. And I'm assuming this is gonna, this is gonna solve that issue. It should, uh, but, but, I, but I also didn't see anything in here that mandated that they use our lot. And I'm also concerned about all those workers that are working on Grandview Square. Uh, there, there wasn't a parking spot to be had anywhere. So I think for people that are going to the, trying to go to the library, other senior center, with all those construction workers over there, they have no chance. So I'm hoping this gives them a chance to find a place to park. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, it sh it should. Um, we ha we did not include the mandate because they told us that they they would put everybody in that spot, and they were happy to do that. Regarding the work, though, that's going on at the other project, the unrelated project right. uh, at Grandview Square, I don't know that we've had, from staff has had discussion with them, but we certainly can and offer that to them. I think we should, okay. uh, because it's, uh, and I know we've got a non-exclusive relationship with Stevens. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the capacity to handle more cars in there. We just need to free up space over there. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Reports and recommendations. Any other comments on consent? All right. Reports and recommendations. Uh, we've got a few matters there that Mr. Neundorf is going to cover. First matter is the uh, potential sale of real estate at 5146 Eden Avenue. An update there. Yes, good morning. Um, the first item on the agenda this morning is the uh, uh, additional details and uh, seeking uh, your authoriz authorization to proceed with the potential sale of real estate at 5146 Eden, the city's old public work site. Uh, at our last meeting on June 28th, the HRA named Franchu as the preferred developer for the site. Um, since that time, uh, we have been continuing to work on the business terms and actually have made some significant changes to the overall structure of the business transaction. Um, uh, we th uh, based on what we heard from, from this group last week, based on conversations with, with, uh, uh, with Franchu's architect and our, our architect and staff, uh, we think that a simplified deal structure is, is a preferable way to go. Um, I'd like to walk you through that today. Um, the outcome is very similar, but we think we can be more efficient in how we use land and how we use money uh, in order to come out with a very similar um, uh, outcome. Uh, so the, the structure, I have a, a very simple rendering and apologies to, uh, 
uh, whoever rendered this one that I hacked up with a bunch of red lines. Um, uh, uh, but this, uh, this concept drawing that's on the screen um, shows the future redevelopment of the site. Uh, it, this rendering is not to scale, so um, let me walk you through some of the details here. Um, but uh, the, uh, at our last meeting, we, we recommended or came forth with an idea where uh, uh, there was a Franchu apartment building on the south, a public facility on the north, and in the middle was a large green space that had green on top, but it was actually parking and infrastructure below. It was a way to, to achieve the parking needs, but it had two shortcomings that we heard. Um, number one, the cost of building this elevated platform and then putting a park on top of it. Um, and it also uh, hindered the city from doing any future expansion um, on that portion of the property. Um, so what we propose instead um, is to uh, simplify the project by dividing the site into two parcels. The south parcel would be about 1.5 acres, um, so a little bit larger than last, the last time. Um, and then the north parcel would be about 1.8 acres. Uh, there would be a clear, a clear line drawn, in the, drawn at that boundary. Uh, the developer would construct their building uh, on their financial terms, uh, on the south side of the border. The city would construct our building uh, north of the border. Um, uh, this arrangement provides many benefits to the city. Um, it allows the city a, a little bit more space to come to uh, design and build the structure that we, that we, uh, that we need there. Um, current studies, and, and we have uh, uh, HGA and uh, uh, Ann Catry from our Parks Department is here as well. They'll talk through it. But it, it does deliver that, that large building, a 30,000 square foot net building um, that we've been talking about for several months. Uh, it also provi provides expansion potential for the site, uh, for the city's site. Um, uh, this arrangement also allows additional public parking uh, at, the, at the facility. While that raises costs, it also delivers a needed uh, element in, in that area. And with this arrangement, we think we can use um, both the, the developer's money and the city's money and the tax incremental funds much more efficiently uh, using this arrangement. Um, and while these are two separate buildings constructed on two separate schedules, um, that's one of the benefits. The, the developer will move a little bit more quickly than the city will to get ours built. Um, it allows uh, those individual schedules to move forward, but also uh, allows the final outcome to, to be well coordinated. So for example, the, uh, uh, the Franchu apartment doesn't work as well without the city's piece. The city's piece, frankly, doesn't work at all without the Franchu apartment. So they are a symbiotic type relationship. Uh, this proposal would return about 45% of the site to the property tax rolls. It's been off the tax roll since uh, the early 60s. Uh, and it would, would retain more than 50%, about 55% of the site for a permanent public use. Um, so there, there are three, um, uh, three big discussion points we'd like to get in front of you this morning, and that's, that's one, of the, uh, 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 one of the reasons we're here for the discussion part of this. But ultimately, um, uh, with your input, we feel that uh, we can recommend that you move forward with the proposed deal. Uh, we are uh, seeking your, your input and direction if there's any concerns that you see here. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, after the discussion, we would be seeking authorization to continue these negotiations, complete them, and then prepare a full sales contract. Um, before I walk through the business terms, I think it's most important that you get a better understanding of where we are with the site plan and how these two elements work together. Um, so we have the architects from DJR Architects working with Franchu here. Uh, Victor Pachati with HGA Archite Architects is here on behalf of, of the city. Um, We'd like uh, each of them to walk through their, their site plans. Um, also, Ann Catry has information about the programming of the public building um, and also some very early cost estimates for that. Uh, and then we'll come back and get into the business, uh, business deal points for your, for your discussion and, and direction. Uh, also this morning, Dave Anderson with Franchu and Alan Hill with Franchu are, are join, uh, joining us. And uh, if, we, if we have any questions, we're all open for that. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to, um, to DJR. Uh, where are they here? Behind me this way. Um, or to Dave Anderson, and we'll go, we'll go through the first part of the site plan. Mr. Chair, 
Well, yes. we're well. While we're waiting for that to get keyed up. Are we, how are we for time this morning on the on the back end of this meeting? Well, are there hard stops at at nine o'clock? If there is, we just need to know so we can time things appropriately. For me, not for you. You're okay. Uh, let me look. I, I could maybe get till nine thirty. Member Fisher. Okay, I can make that work, 9.30. Good, good morning, uh, Mr. Morning. Chair, Mr. Commissioners. Uh, Dave Anderson with Frau and Schuh. Uh, and I'll, I'll just quickly walk you through. I, I don't know that there's a lot to elaborate on design-wise, but certainly we can have DJR uh, 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 step up if, if there's questions specifically to design. But mostly at this point, what we've done is just show a, a continuation or evolution of the uh, concept uh, here for how the South uh, site will be developed. So the concept is the same uh, in terms of this being a podium uh, with five stories of, of structure, residential structure above. Um, with the um, adjustments that uh, Mr. Neuendorf spoke of, we are now parking the site with two levels of parking under the residential building. So we're self-containing all of the parking. So there will be a level actually below grade, and then there will be a level uh, at grade, which is on the podium level, and then the residential uh, structure above. Um, so in order to do that, the parcel became slightly larger, dimensionally needed to get the parking adequate to uh, park the building and self-park the building. Um, so really what you're seeing here are some of the adjustments um, physically, how the structure will orient, and I think one of the more distinct elements of this is we, rather than having a pure uh, sort of two legs uh, on the west and east portion of the site. The east portion, the east leg, would be somewhat shortened to open that um, amenity deck a bit to the south and east. So to kind of open it to that Arcadia Eden intersection a bit. And then what you see here uh, conceptually in the blue is uh, the opportunity, and this is subject to a bit further refinement and study, but the opportunity to bring those row, uh, row townhomes. Uh, to the street, to engage the street, to activate uh, the corner a bit with residential units. And uh, we like that idea. We hope uh, through continued uh, design efforts we can accommodate that. But it, uh, it plays into the parking format and how parking is delivered on the site as well. Um, again, uh, not a lot of other changes from what you've seen before uh, architecturally. Uh, the remaining portion of the site then to the north, uh, as was mentioned, would be uh, program for the civic space, which would now be um, fill, earth, and then uh, finished with uh, park, plaza, um, uh, turf, etc. Uh, and then the continuation of the, uh, the civic building to the north. So we can certainly answer any other questions, but at this juncture, uh, we're still at 143 units in size. So the building has not gotten larger. It's still the same program uh, with the residential unit count and um, and, and concept for the project. So we'd be happy to answer any other questions. Member Stoughton? You said the building, has, has the footprint gotten larger? So it's gotten larger, it's just that the number of units hasn't expanded. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, correct, right. Yeah, it's, it's dimensionally really the size now is to accommodate the parking under the building. So the footprint, the foundation, uh, now can accommodate parking with two levels under the building. So that's the footprint you needed in order to get enough parking spaces on two levels. Correct. All right. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson? Yeah, that was one of the questions I had too, is whether the number of units remained the same or changed. With townhouses along the edge, I assumed that we had more units now. But it counts the same. I understand the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Anderson, could you come back up, Director Catry, before we go to you? Um, one of the questions that uh, Member Brindle, who couldn't be here today, uh, asked uh, that um, we inquire about, and I think it's an important one, and it, certainly Member Fisher and Member Staunton will recall from working on the various committees that um, 
w one of the principal reasons that we thought about a combination of private and public uses on this site was because the private would help pay for the public improvements. So I'm wanting, I would like, before I ask Mr. Neuendorf the question of what's his perspective as to what this partnership, uh, how this partnership has benefited or how we fulfilled the vision of the, of the, f of the folks that worked on the framework. What's your perception of um, how your proposed development benefits the public portion of it? Uh, Mr. Chair, commissioners, if I'm understanding the question, it's uh, we have a private development here that um, is generating TIF revenue. And so if, if we're coming at it from a, a financial perspective, um, is, is the question, you know, I think that's, a, that's certainly a, the basic part of it. Yeah. Yeah, the fundamental part of it. Yeah, and, and you know, I think uh, from that uh, standpoint, you know, certainly this project provides a, a substantial element, plan, uh, plan element to the site that generates tax revenue. I think that TIF generation uh, projected is in the range of six million or greater. Uh, and that, you know, um, is a, you know, early projection of what the potential of that is, how those proceeds get used, presumably, are going to be for benefits in the district. So whether it be structured parking in the civic building, whether it be other qualified elements of streetscape, pedestrian bridges, connectivity, you know, those would be the kinds of things that the economic catalyst of a private development on the portion of the site uh, will allow it to start to happen. With the phasing of this, and, and another component of this benefit, physical planning-wise, is you will be able to now uh, execute a private development project that can start before the public, the large public uh, component, the civic building. So you can start to generate TIF proceeds in advance of those expenditures that will come sometime down the road, maybe sooner than later, but at least you have a revenue model you can start to plan. There are other properties generating TIF in the district as well, so uh, you know, certainly uh, that's the purpose of a TIF district. Um, but the collaborative nature, and I think uh, Mr. Neuendorf mentioned it, uh, we see the residential piece being a nice uh, complementary component to the uh, civic activities at the civic building, whether it be senior activities, community activities, arts. I think there's a synergy there that the two are playing with uh, and, uh, and enjoying. And uh, likewise, I think the, the civic building will um, uh, benefit from having a, a good quality neighbor uh, potential members, potential users, uh, and the like. So we just create a more active street environment, I think, as well, with what we're, we're uh, working uh, to achieve here. Uh, Arcadia will be activated, certainly. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to do there, as well as Eden. And, uh, and also take advantage of some of the, uh, the uh, transportation elements that are provided in the site. But there, is, there is a transit stop uh, right in front of the building today, so hopefully the residents uh, here that will, will live will be able to use some of that tra transit connectivity. So those would be other points I would add if there's other thoughts on that. We look forward to discussing them. Okay. The next question I've got for you doesn't, isn't really one I like to ask about uh, in this context, but it's important, I think, because we've got an obligation to the residents of our town to maximize the value of the property that we were, would contemplate selling. Um, uh, in our prior meeting, you talked about the distinctions between the value of this property per square foot, if you will, per acre, as opposed to the school bus garage site. Uh, when, I, when I just run my basic numbers using the school bus garage site as a uh, comparable at $65 a square foot, what I come up with for a number, um, a value number on that total acreage of 3.3 .3 acres when you multiply 43,560 square feet, which is a, the per acre square footage amount, it, it comes to a total value of 9.343 million. The south parcel uh, would be uh, 4.247, 100. The north parcel, uh, 3.5 million. Um, no, no, I don't have that right. Something is something went askew there. Something wrong with yeah. the math. Yeah, something went wrong with the math. Yeah, five point one million for the north. So, uh, the proposed purchase price for the uh, 
South parcel at 4.24, or the proposed, uh, the uh, relative value at the, uh, using the uh, Trammell Crow numbers at 4.247 million, and the proposed purchase price at 2.989 million. There's quite a delta there. And I'm wondering if you can explain uh, that pricing differential from your perspective. Um, why isn't this 1.5 acres on the South parcel worth as much as Trammell Crow paid for the school bus garage acreage? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, I think there's a extensive uh, package of study on the comps and those variables that was provided to the HRA a um, month or month and a half ago. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to review those comparables uh, because we did provide a substantial level of detail uh, to staff and we've had considerable discussions with, with staff. Um, so when we're looking at the market, one distinction, and I, th I think we've made a lot of direct reference to the Trammell Crow site, it is a different product, number one. It's 55 plus age restricted with services to a very specific market. And therefore, uh, the rent structure, the style, the development in and of itself um, is a, a, a different equation. So um, that is one major factor, I think, when looking at that design. So that, um, that factor comes into play. We're, in this particular case, working on a market rate uh, product. Um, so we're looking at rates equivalent to similar projects in the market. We're not uh, overshooting the high end of the range, uh, but those are certainly factors that play into uh, how land is priced uh, in that equation. Now, there's a, a many projects in the immediate competitive market to the type of product being built here that is substantially less than the price that's, that's being offered. There's no question about that. Are there projects that, are off, that uh, have and uh, may pay more? There certainly may be and have been. So there, there's no question about that. What we've tried to do for this site and for the variables that we're trying to bring together, tried to find a, a fair and, uh, and uh, uh, reasonable price given the market. And I think that's what we've done. So Merit and uh, uh, Commissioners, I would, um, I would come at that question from that perspective that we really have to find where a project can be feasible and uh, that is a price that we've reached. Okay. That's the price that works for you to make this feasible. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Neundorf, I'd like to have you come back up and address that same issue. As I said, this isn't the kind of thing that's very comfortable to do in public, but here we are with a $1.258 million delta between a piece of property that's just across the railroad tracks from where this property is. Right. We need, we need, we need to understand why you're recommending that this be this is an appropriate sale price because you're asking us to embrace some deal terms today. So the the purchase price of the land has been a topic of conversation since we started this back in December of 2017. Um, uh, uh, staff has pushed the developer. Um, their price has come up a little bit. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, contingent upon. Um, uh, a low interest loan to support their affordable housing as well. Um, but I, I think that I think you asked the right question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the price that's proposed is is not the highest that you're that you'll see in a Dyna. It's not at the top of the market. Um, it's in with it's it is within the reasonable range, however. Um, Mr. Anderson had mentioned a list of, of uh, recent sales that we shared at Oh, I think the meeting back in May or May or June—I forgot which one that was—but um, certainly, uh, you know, you can look at a lot of different recent sales in the area in Edina, St. Louis Park, Minneapolis, and the in the surrounding areas. You can find the ones that sold at, at a low price. You can find the ones that sold at a, at a high price. Um, uh, in my opinion, this price is within the reasonable range, um, but it, it is a challenge. Um, uh, especially looking at the recent acquisition by Trammell Crow. I mean, uh, that parcel sold um, for about 2.9 million per acre, uh, whereas right now we're looking at about 2 million an acre for this parcel. So there is a significant delta. That is that is ex exactly correct. Um, I think one of the key differences um, is uh, is that the Trammell Crow is a um, it's developed by an outside investment group that will 
they bought the land, they'll build the, prop, the project, and then they'll, they'll sell it to the highest investor, and it'll, you know, it'll, it'll uh, continue on in operations. The Franchu project is a locally owned project. Um, uh, the intention is that they will develop it, they will build it, they will own it, and they will operate it. They won't just sell it. Um, so, uh, in order to you know, uh, to make sure that they've got a project that works over the over the years, I think they need to be um, careful in how they uh, uh, invest in the project and what their what those line items are. Um, so, I I can't really defend the price. I mean, I've I've pushed for a higher price as well, um, but it is within the reasonable range. Um, we looked at uh, locally local projects. Um, I mean, some of them get kind of old now, but like the Onyx over on York Avenue, uh, the Millennium on York, the Promenade, the Aria, a lot of those in the Southdale area. And while some of those land sales closed a few years ago, um, this, uh, uh, this project is within that general range. Um, their density is a little bit lower than some of those other projects. Um, for example, uh, the Trammell Crow project, uh, now called the Avador, uh, Avador Living, if you've seen that one. Um, they've got about 165 units, whereas on this site, Franchu is propose, proposing about 145. So their units are a little bit larger, a little bit more generous uh, in space, um, which does lower their rental income. Um, so it's, you know, I think as they put these plans together, uh, and they still have a ways to go, we, we all have a ways to go. Um, there's certainly cautiousness in, in creating and delivering the right project with the right combination of units and amenities. Um, so I could certainly support the sale, um, but I would certainly also acknowledge that it is not the highest price uh, out there in the marketplace. All right, thank you. You know, I'm wondering if we shouldn't even be talking about the affordable housing issue in sequence here before we even get to talking about the public parcel piece unless you sure. have a you have a sequence that you want to follow for the presentation um they are intertwined so uh happy to, to uh, discuss that right now so, it, seems, um, it seems to me to be important the two important considerations are selling price of the land and then this request that we give them a loan similar to what we did down at 50th in france and there be 15 years of uh, worth of affordable housing at 10 percent, 10 percent, 50 percent of AMI. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So the, the two are intertwined. Um, so a few months ago, we um, in our negotiations, we had um, uh, challenged Franchu with that purchase price uh, uh, dilemma, um, and they were a they were able to increase their purchase cr price significantly. I think it was around six or seven hundred thousand. Um, but in order to make their numbers work, um, since they are doing the affordable units within their project, they'll deliver 10% uh, of the floor area of, of the building as affordable units. Uh, those units will be priced to, to uh, rent to folks that earn 50% of the area's median income, and they will remain affordable for 15 years. So that's, that's the city's policy as far as what they'll deliver. Uh, in order to make their overall numbers work, however, um, they have requested a low interest loan of $1.2 million. Um, those funds uh, would uh, likely come either from the Edina Housing Foundation, um, a separate group that is in the similar line of business, um, or the HRA, through the HRA's Affordable Housing Fund. Um, this, uh, 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 this request is something that, that I raise um, to you just to get your direction. Uh, at a recent meeting when we discussed the Pentagon Park projects and the North Project and their affordability um, just about a week ago with that meeting, there was a lot of concern here about what, the, what our policy meant. Um, and so with the current proposal for this property, I think we're going to run into the same dilemma. So I wanted to raise that as a potential issue and see where you all stand. Um, in our conversations with Franchu, they've been very fear, firm and clear to me that in order to achieve the $2.9 uh, million acquisition price, uh, that would be contingent upon the $1.2 million loan. Um, uh, from the city's perspective, uh, we do have the money. Uh, our affordable housing fund does have $1.2 million left in it. Um, 
uh, while we have made a pledge to the Aon project down on 76th Street, um, we still would have enough money to fund that project that we've committed to so far uh, and this request. Um, but it, it is a deviation, I believe, from our policy. Um, uh, typically, our policy has uh, 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 been more open to increased <coughs> densities on sites so that, they, so, so that they could deliver a mixture of, of, uh, of, of unit prices, market rate and affordable. Um, uh, the, the one exception to that practice so far has been the Market Street projects down at 50th in France, where we did give them an eight, uh, I believe an $800,000 loan on very similar terms. Um, uh, we did that uh, in the spirit of uh, you know, working collaboratively with that developer as their project really shifted to, change, to meet what our true needs were. Um, and with that project, it's, um, uh, you know, while it's, it's residential and mixed use and those types of things, that developer is building the city's parking for us and then bearing the cost and the debt and the impact of, of that. Um, so it's a different comparable. I don't, personally, I don't believe it's a directly comparable to this project. Um, uh, so if it, uh, 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 if it is a concern about f providing that funding, um, we should hear that now before we get too far down the road. Um, uh, and, and maybe Mr. Anderson can comment uh, uh, on that as well. Um, uh, I also mentioned the Adina Housing Foundation. Um, uh, they did meet this week. They meet on a monthly basis. They're a private, non-for-profit group. Um, I believe they will be um, considering whether or not they're interested in, that, in the, a similar loan. Um, I know they were introduced to the project uh, at their recent meeting. I don't think they've given it full consideration at all. I think that's coming up in the future. Um, uh, but affordable housing certainly does have an impact to the rental flow of, of a project. Um, so it's, uh, um, it is a, a, a real challenge. Uh, you you talked about a distinction between this request <clears throat> and what was done down at Market Street. One of the things I recall about the Market Street project, uh, as we um, contemplated giving a loan to help make the affordable housing uh, possible, was the, the timing relative to the implementation of our policy was uh, was different. It was uh, earlier in the process as we were feeling our way on the affordable housing piece, but also. Uh, as I recall, uh, that developer was very transparent with its numbers. And Franchu may well have been, be very transparent with you about its returns and its, uh, its pro forma. I, I just don't know. Uh, have you had that same level of transparency with uh, Franchu that you've had with Market Street, with the Nolan Mains folks? With the, um, with these Current proposals, um, we certainly have looked through their numbers uh, several months ago. Um, as the projects have changed, I mean, we started off in January looking at an 18-story high-rise. So, so um, there was a lot of uh, scrubbing of the numbers. Uh, Ellers Associates on, our, on the city's behalf went through those numbers. Um, we have not gotten to that same level on this concept. Um, but if we do mo move forward with a loan, we would expect to see their numbers to make sure that it is a, legit a legitimate need. Um, when we last looked through the numbers a, a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago, their returns were um, uh, on the low end of the reasonable range. Um, so, you know, while the, the, it was a viable project, um, uh, it was not an uh, overly inflated return to the developer. Um, with this rearrangement, we just haven't had time yet to look at the numbers, quite frankly. Um, so, uh, but as we've asked um, uh, recently, Franchu has certainly shared their numbers with us. Mr. Chair, I, I think when, when, when the council and uh, the HRA and the Housing Foundation originally uh, began to discuss uh, the policy that we have now and we've amended it a couple of times, we have, from a staff standpoint, I'll comment, and as we've talked about it with our consultants, we have viewed this as a new obligation that we're placing on developers of qualifying projects in, in not in a way that 
we assist them with with <coughs> financing to provide that just like our, our park our, our park improvement fee if that's applicable we wouldn't loan a developer money so that they can pay their park improvement fee back to the city so when we've discussed this with them uh, that's been the manner in which we've discussed it. It's an mm -hmm. obligation. Here's the ob here's how we calculate the obligation, and and you have to provide that to the city. It's not an opportunity for the city to help you provide that to the city. It's an obligation of the developer to provide it to the city. If if it's it's certainly the council's uh, prerogative to to change or amend that policy, but that's the way that we, we've been discussing it with them. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think I don't think anyone else has any questions at this point in time. So, um, so we'll, let's finish up the presentation then. But there's um, uh, so so far we we started to discuss two of the biggest issues, quite frankly, in the business transaction, the sales price and the question about the affordable housing loan. So, um, a lot of the other business uh, points are pretty routine, nothing too extraordinary there. Um, but I think something is ex that that is extraordinary, and, and definitely we want to get to. Um, is how the remainder of the site works. You know, for, for years, since 2008, 2010, we've talked about public uses on this site, and is it a combination, or what's the public piece look like? Um, uh, so uh, I'll turn it back to Ann Catry to walk through um, how the city would use our uh, uh, 1.8 acres of the site. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. In the past three weeks, we have completed a facility analysis of a potential new community facility at Grandview. First of all, I would like to introduce Victor Pashadi from HGA. As I engaged this feasibility study, um, I thought it would be a perfect fit for me to go back to HGA as they were the, uh, the architect that we worked with back in 2015 and 2016 uh, when we did another feasibility study for this site. So as part of the feasibility study, we looked at a multi-purpose community facility that included an art center, active adult center, and some sort of a cafe or restaurant. We also, as Bill mentioned earlier, assumed that the site would contain an outdoor park on the south end of the facility. And as part of the deliverables for you this morning, uh, we created a draft program for the community facility space, the number of square feet required for that program, the parking requirement for that program, the capital cost of construction, and the <coughs> annual operating costs of the facility. <coughs> As I mentioned, uh, we completed a similar study back in 2015 <coughs> and 2016, and the results of that feasibility study uh, very directly impacted um, and allowed us to use that work to influence the work that we did um, over the past month. So what we determined uh, for space needed to create these programming opportunities uh, were art center space of gross square footage of just over 16,000 square feet, active adult space of almost 13,000 square feet, a cafe, restaurant, and culinary arts programming space of just under 5,000 square feet, and then when you add the commons area administrative and building support, it gave us a gross square footage of 45,145 square feet. I would like to pass uh, the presentation over to Victor Pashadi at this point uh, to talk a little bit about the site fit portion and then also the capital construction costs. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, the study that we have been asked to do would be considered a fit planning study and massing study. So I want to point out at the beginning that the work that you will see is by no means a piece of architecture or suggest a building, but it does suggest the potential size and mass of the structure with this revised program. And it will also show um, the degree to which the, prog the project would um, impact the site. The rendering that you're seeing um, illustrates a two-story structure which was similar to the study that we had completed in, in 2016. Um, again, there are some features here that are conceptual in nature. 
but it does show the public plaza park in the midsection of the site, bridging the housing development to the south and the community facility uh, building to the north. What you're seeing there is a conceptual combination of paved plaza place, uh, space and green space, which is yet to be designed. Um, the sloping green space that you're seeing um, is only a concept meant to suggest that there would be a welcoming access between Arcadia and the plaza, um, that that would be um, an ease, easy transition and welcoming point on the site. Uh, this represents a combination of a first floor plan and the site plan. Um, one thing I wanted to point out here is as we've been working alongside the development to the south, I believe that the footprint you are seeing here for the development to the south um, is probably is a step behind the current iteration. And I just wanted to say that for the record, the, where it says proposed residential, this footprint is an older generation. I just wanted to call your attention um, to that inaccuracy. Um, what is in the correct place here is this yellow line that you see on the site plan does represent the correct location of the proposed property boundary. Um, creating the boundary between the 1.5 acre parcel to the south and the 1.8 acre parcel um, to the north. Once again, I would call this a fit plan, um, not necessarily a building design, but this illustrates first floor programs that contain a cafe restaurant element here at the southeast. The green programs represent senior active adult program and part of the art center programs, namely the pottery programs um, associated with a kiln yard would occur here at the northwest um, corner of the site, which is also where the building loading and service dock would be, um, would be contained. Um, we're showing a primary entry at the northeast corner of the site that would be on grade um, right about at the matching the existing grade of that northwest portion of the site. Also shown, and you will see it in our cost estimating, is a pedestrian bridge um, between the plaza, it could lead directly into the building, um, and the parking ramp to the west of the railroad corridor that if needed could provide an enhanced parking connection um, to the ramp to the west. This is the second floor plan, um, which shows that a lot of the um, art center programs would occupy the center court. Because the building is nominally um, a square, to bring daylight into the um, inside face of these rooms, we're showing a daylit courtyard um, in the center of the building. There is ample opportunity in this building to create um, rooftop spaces. So this green space caps some of the programs that you saw on the first floor and would allow an outdoor space that could be um, partly plaza, part green roof that would welcome that southern exposure and overlook um, the park and plaza space to the south. Um, we're going to go underneath the building now and talk a little bit about parking. Um, as was mentioned before, in this iteration of the property development, there is not parking below the park and plaza space. Um, the residential project, uh, as was mentioned by Fraunchu, contains its parking capacity below the building. That paradigm continues into the public community center facility. On the north side of the site, um, it's illustrating approximately 300 parking stalls on three levels. While we haven't calculated the metrics of exact parking needed for the community center functions, we do know that the 300 stalls exceeds what would be the minimum need for the community center programs and thus does provide some additional capacity for parking for the district uh, below the, um, the community center site. This is showing the, what we're calling P1, the uppermost level of the parking, directly below the community center. That would have an on-grade access um, from the east here from our Arcadia. As you know, the slope along Arcadia and the site is significant, so this location times out well to provide an on-grade access into the parking structure. 
moving further down, um, P2 would align almost exactly with existing grade on the site today. Um, so that would be um, the elevation of parking P2. Similar to the proposed residential project, P3, or the lowest level of parking, would be excavated one level below the existing grade. Those three levels um, together provide that approximately 300, uh, 300 stall parking. Um, we're showing here a summary of updated cost estimates of capital cost for the project. And I'll just walk through um, some of the high level metrics that we're seeing here. Beginning with the building cost, we're showing a um, construction cost that includes contingency and two years of, a, of construction escalation costs included at approximately $18.3 million for the building. Um, the parking stalls are estimated at a net value of $30,000 per parking stall, um, which is um, a metric for parking that occurs below buildings and below grade. We are also carrying um, dollars separately for the public plaza outdoor park to the south of the building at approximately 2.3 million. So construction costs for those three components would total um, $31.4 million. Then we have added a percentage multiplier for soft costs for each of those components. The soft costs for the building are the highest um, because the building would have those components of furniture and technology and internal workings of the building. The soft costs for the parking and plaza are less. You see the then total project cost um, all in across the bottom. So for all three components, this yields a project cost of 37 um, 0.86 million for the work that you are seeing. Thank you, Victor. And then finally for you this yeah, morning, Victor, we uh, have... Victor, uh, one question. Uh, Director Cattery, before you go into the operating expenses, um, there's no land costs in here. That's correct. No land costs, Mr. Chair. Right. So we could have a land cost in here of $5 million because if we sold the land, it has that with potential value. Is that correct? Correct. Sorry. There is not the uh, what I call a the more opportun accurate. opportunity cost yep. for, for land. Absolutely. All right. Okay. And finally, uh, this morning we have for you a summary pro, pro forma of uh, operating revenues and expenses for a potential new facility uh, with the program that we have described. Uh, what is not included in this pro forma is any bonding costs uh, for the building or depreciation. Uh, but we are showing a net operating loss of just over 40, uh, excuse me, $477,000 with a cost recovery percentage of 65%. Currently between these two facilities, um, as you know, we would be planning to move both our art center and our senior center operations here. Uh, we did a five-year average of losses between those two facilities and it averages um, with a loss between the two of about $225,000. So this illustrates the difference that, uh, that we would have with the new facility. So with that, we stand to answer any questions. Questions, folks? Member Staunton? If you could go back to the um, site plan. Right, that's a good enough one. So um, I know, Mr. Pashati, that you said that the, the um, rendering from a footprint perspective of the, the private development on the south end was um, behind reality. I'm wondering if the, the actual, I guess what I'm trying to get at is will the building footprint as I understand it, where the yellow line is, is where their parking goes to underground. And the question is, will the, will the building footprint expand all the way to where their parking is? Yeah, I want to make sure that I'm speaking correctly for the development team and DJR. Yeah, and maybe um, they can answer it too. But uh, the answer is no, that project would not go all the, directly to the property line. There is an offset um, between the property itself 
and the north portion of the housing project. And I would defer to the Brown Shoe team on that exact distance. Hello, the distance the building would be from that property line is 15 to 20 feet south, and that would be due to fire code or our IBC code in Minnesota. So it'd only be about 15 to 20 feet. So the, the parking underneath it would expand all the way to the property line? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Member Fisher? Yeah, right. We, we almost had oops, both architects up. And, and my question is, we've gone through many iterations. We've had public on the south, public on the north. We've had tall, we've had short on the private development. And sometimes I, I think we're our, we are where we are, but we forget to kind of loop back and ask the question again. And, and I would just ask it now, from both design of both of these projects, do we have things in the right spot? Or are we better off with public on the south and the private on the north? Where, from a design perspective and fitting things on this site, do both parties feel like we are in the right spot for these fit plans? Well, Commissioner Fisher, that's a complex question uh, because there are a lot of other metrics at, at play here um, besides the design, of course. I think, but you're asking specifically from a design urban perspective. Um, I can speak to the community facility. Um, there are pros and cons. Um, as you know, our team has studied it on the north and on the south. Um, there are pros and cons to both. Some of the advantages to the community facility favoring the north side of the site is a, f a potential future connection to the west across the rail corridor um, and a possible bridge that is planned there to both current retail as well as future development um, on the Grandview site. Um, the other advantage to that being on the north, it has a favorable relationship to the grade on the northeast side and, and allows uh, for that entrance. And then availing itself of an open plaza to the south um, is a very nice advantage to that. If the community facility were on the south, it would have direct street frontage, but it would not have the same um, amenity for outdoor space, or the outdoor space would be to the north where it would be um, less sunlit. The advantage if the community center were to the south would be visibility, um, direct street frontage and visibility right on the corner of um, Arcadia and Eden. Um, so um, I don't have a position on whether one um, site is better than the other. Um, I think there are advantages to having the community facility in the site that it is now, and it will affect the design to make sure it's designed most favorably for that site. Okay, so, so it seems like the, the, the two negatives of where it is now is just probably a little less opportunity to be sort of that beacon that, that you know, from the freeway that you would actually see the, the community facility, and then the, the public transit component as we imagine it today, um, wouldn't be part of our public building per se. Um, and, and those are, I'm not, I don't know sitting here today what's the right answer or the wrong answer. I was just wondering from the perspective of the folks that are trying to make these designs work uh, because I know we've all tried them in, different, in the different locations. I do like the, the south orientation opening to the, the park and, the, and how that all works together. And, and maybe that's really the most compelling thing. And I'm glad you brought about. up the notion of the elevation. Um, while, as I mentioned, it would have ex um, more exposure in some ways on the south portion of the site, because of the significant elevation change, it is on the upper portion of the site. And from the upper part of the building, um, one can, um, I believe this is the highest point in Edina, um, elevationally. And so one can see downtown. Um, it is a two-story building, so as it would move down to the south portion of the site, one could say its street presence increases, its vertical presence would decrease, um, because the upper part of the site 
might actually align roughly with the roof of the building on the lower part of the site. So once again, there are pros and cons elevationally and in terms of visibility, the height at the top of the hill, so to speak, is a nice amenity. All right, thank you. Member Stewart. Thank you. Um, so we have in the past, I know every time we've talked about the civic building here, we've talked about how important it is that it not just be an art center, that it not just be a senior uh, uh, center. And, and in fact, I think we wanted to try to move away from the term senior center. Um, but uh, that it be a hub, that it be a, a place where uh, people can come, uh, people can move through it. Um, having a public transit element was certainly an, an, an attractive thing for us. Um, so which, uh, I, I don't know if that changes the math on the number of parking stalls that are appropriate here. Um, one of the uses that we had talked about, actually that was shown to us in an iteration oh, three years ago, this is back when the design was on the north side, so this is before the flip-flopping. Um, uh, there was a, a inclusion of a multi-use uh, space that would be good for performing arts. Uh, might, the seats might fold flat and it would be a, a appropriate for hosting uh, piano recitals or weddings or uh, whatever other uses people might have. Um, I gather that that kind of use has been eliminated from this? Uh, Commissioner Stewart, yes, that has been eliminated. Uh, we eliminated based on what we felt was um, council direction at uh, the last meeting. However, it is something that could be added back. The main drawback from that would be the additional parking and the additional costs that would, would be required along with that. Um, it certainly would be a wonderful amenity for the community and that was probably the biggest and most difficult for staff to remove as well. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the way that we had it designed in the previous iteration, uh, we were referring to it as a white box space. Um, it could be a space that could be used as a, a, a smaller performing space. It could have been used as a 250 seat event space. Um, it could have been used um, in a very multi-purpose sort of fashion. Uh, but besides the additional capital cost for construction, the additional cost for the additional parking requirement is significant. Yeah, and I, but I do like the idea of expanding our, our art uh, facility to something more than just visual arts so that we can have a nod toward the performing arts. I think that would be a real plus. The other um, element in terms of this being this hub and this gathering space, uh, it feels to me like you do um, perhaps want to have sort of a great hall area, something that, that uh, is really that sort of big public space. I don't know if this can accommodate that. Um, my hope would be that we at someday in the future might get a trolley car along the Dan Patch line there. Uh, I think the ideal place for putting that platform might be in the exact corner where you've got the building services right now. So um, I, I want to make sure we plan ahead and have all of those things thought through and, and included as we, as we uh, attempt to move forward here. Um, and, and so um, my concern is, I, I, again, I still don't know if 30,000 square feet is sufficient for the uses that I envision for uh, our, our civic building on this site. Um, and um, so I, I, I have a, a lot of uh, uh, issues that make me hesitate to, to endorse moving forward on any of this at this time. So, Commissioner Stewart, I, I would just like to mention that this certainly isn't intended to be a final design. It was intended more to be a starting point to give you um, a picture, a snapshot of what the community facility could look like. As Victor mentioned, this was just a, a site fit exercise and we wanted to give you an opportunity and to make sure that you understood from a community facility standpoint, there would be a significantly more um, 
expensive operating loss to operate this type of facility. And we wanted to give you an idea as well as you're making a decision on this entire site, the capital cost of a facility. So we certainly by no means intended this to be final architecture, final design, or even final program, uh, but just uh, an idea for you to be able to, uh, to make a, a decision on the entire site. Member Song. On that point, um, to Commissioner Stewart's notion of a event space, for lack of a better term, um, which it strikes me could host a variety of different <coughs> events, um, would the, would there's a potential for leasing that out for private events, um, weddings, parties, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I assume because you've kind of not included that, mm -hmm. that you have you also haven't done the analysis on how that might affect the operating costs. Uh, Commissioner Stewart, um, or Sutton, I'm sorry. We did not. Um, you know, again, we were really looking at the, uh, the, uh, the parking costs associated with the additional 250 person capacity for that site. So um, what do you figure for additional parking stalls on that? Do you have a rough idea? Um, I'm going to take a, um, take a guess. I, yeah, and I, I'll, if, I'll stipulate to the fact that this is, you know, thank w, you. WAG right now. <laughs> what, was, what was programmed in 2015-16 was a space that would accommodate 250 people in a banquet situation. So that's at, at tables and chairs. In a lecture or performance situation, that would be approximately 500 people. Often what we use for a place of assembly is one parking stall per four um, of maximum capacity. So I guess that would be in the, in the low 100s if we take that 500 um, capacity number, about 100 stalls um, additional for the event space. Which is another three million, another three million in parking. Um, well, what I, I did mention earlier that the parking capacity shown in this plan exceeds what would be required for the program shown in this plan. Um, once again, this is a guess. I think that the 300 provided probably would be very close to what would be needed building wide with the addition of the event center. Oh. I'd be, um, we're going to be really close there. So we may not need to add a bunch of parking. That's to correct. Add the events. And I, I just want to add the notion because I think Commissioner Stewart's on to something here. That it, and again, this isn't the final program. We're not going to solve the final program today. It's just sort of, but. This bridge to the parking across the rail, the ultimate build out of the infrastructure on the other side of the rail could include more parking. I don't think parking is going to be the big um, problem here. I, I, and, it, and it's about using the parking appropriately throughout the day. So the pressure on parking and the public ramp across the rail is going to be, there's going to be the least amount of use over there when you would have most events in an event center type um, setting. So I, I'm actually not that concerned about the parking. I think we can make that work relatively inexpensively in the big picture. If I may address uh, Commissioner Stewart's um, previous um, comments about the event space. Um, the um, commission as well as council has a really nice tool available because of the rigor that the program was studied in 2015 and 16. There is a room-by-room room, um, program available along with um, operating analyses at the time that looked at all those programs. So it would be a fairly straightforward to catalog those or package them into options looking at adding or subtracting certain programs. Um, could look at that very quickly to be able to assess the options of, of growing and shrinking what you're seeing today. The toolkit's already there. Other questions at this point in time? Okay. All right, thank you. So Mr. Neundorf, would you come back up please? Uh, back to that uh, question I 
raised with Mr. Anderson at the beginning. How does private development assist with the proposed public amenity? I think there's uh, two primary ways that that occurs, and this uh, uh, is rooted back in, in those seven guiding principles. Um, one is just having the appropriate combination of land uses in that area. Um, with the uh, uh, construction of a new civic uh, uh, amenity, the public facility here, um, there would be an outdoor space. Um, if the remainder of the site were something less vibrant, um, uh, I think there'd be a dead spot there. Having the residential piece, having residential neighbors um, uh, creates people walking up and down the sidewalk at different times of the day, taking the dogs for a walk. Um, it just creates a, a more lively area. Um, with the existing businesses that are there today, you know, when the businesses close, it's a, it's a ghost town. Um, uh, having residents in the neighborhood really changes that whole dynamic, something that I, that I think has been important um, from the very uh, beginning of these conversations about Grandview. And the second piece is, is just monetarily. Um, when that parcel gets sold, um, number one, it's a, it's a cash infusion, infusion into the city to help pay for this new amenity. The property gets returned to the tax rolls to the benefit initially just for the land value of the, of the school district, of the county, of the city. Um, and then thirdly, it's that incremental tax. So um, since this is in a, in a TIF district, the new taxes generated from the residential apartments um, would be used to pay for the infrastructure that makes this, the community piece possible. Um, and when that uh, designation expires, then it would return fully to the tax rolls. But it's those two things, adding those vibrant combination of uses and frankly, starting with the capital to get the money flowing to make this whole thing possible. On the, on the former issue of vibrancy, it seems to me that uh, this is a little bit different than what we've seen in other places. Usually we'll put in the public amenity, the public realm development first, and then private development springs up around it. And a great example is the apartments at Byerly's, the redevelopment of the Byerly's site around what was going to be our you know, phase four of the of the promenade. And uh, we've seen other development around the promenade, the Guitar Center, but for the promenade, and we wouldn't see some of the development we're seeing. Here we're kind of jointly planning these things, uh, but we flipped the sequence. And uh, so I, I, I appreciate and get the vibrancy argument uh, and the financial argument as well. So I think you've helped me on, on that particular issue of how this private development assists with the proposed public uh, amenity from both a, uh, a living circumstance as well as a financial circumstance. Uh, that's good. I'm still, I've still got a problem on this uh, financial piece, the selling price, the proposed selling price. So, you know, one of, the, one of the great things that we haven't really talked about is that holding this land for the period of time we have has created quite an increase in value. So we, we kind of joke about amongst ourselves about admiring the problem of what to do over there for a decade or more. Uh, but in that period of time, uh, what I recall is that when uh, we agreed to move the public works facility uh, down to the commercial industrial district west of International Dairy Queen, we had the land appraised at Grandview, that 3.3 acres. And my recollection is it appraised out at about $4 million. And now it seems to me we're somewhere north of $8 million in value for that piece of property. So in, in the sense of a real estate investment, it was a good hold. The, the question now is, and, and everyone on this dais, whether we're wearing our HRA hat or our city council hat, has to be able to stand up and talk to any citizen in our town and say why we sold this land, why, why there's that $1.258 million delta. And I get the fact that Fraunchu has their own parameters for an investment that they have standards that they need to meet internally uh, to be able to make an investment feasible. But we also have that issue with respect to the obligation we have to the citizens of Edina. We, we need to be able to explain to them why uh, we would potentially uh, accept your recommendation and sell this land for what appears to be uh, a million plus less than what land sold for just across the railroad tracks. So one thing I don't think we've done and I think would be helpful is we've never, have we had a professional appraisal of our property updated? You know, I think Shenahan might have done it back in 
whenever that whenever it was when we sold the public works facility. I know that you've looked at comparables internally. I appreciate that, uh, but. Uh, a professional set of eyes on this from an appraisal standpoint, I think would be important to have. So on, on my to-do list, that would be one of the things I would say is that uh, I'm not gonna be comfortable agreeing on this selling price or these deal terms until we get our land appraised by an outside professional appraiser and get that, get that old appraisal updated. Um, I don't wanna be, I want to be as uh, confident in our numbers as we can be. And if it doesn't work for Fraunchu, it doesn't work, you know? But w that's, our first obligation isn't to Fraunchu companies. Our first obligation is to the residents of the city of Edina. Uh, in response, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, we have not updated the appraisal. Uh, it's been several years. Um, the reason that we have not done that is up until a couple weeks ago, we were really looking at this, you know, uh, a truly intertwined collaborative project, um, which got very pricey. So now that we've split the parcel and really simplified it, it would be much easier to get a to get an appraisal because we're you know at this point it's two parcels of land. Yeah. There's not all these intertwined parking and park on top and who owns which part of it. So it is that's much great, easier to do that. Point. I think it, now it does it does does become clear. It, it's a much easier for a professional appraiser to look at our property and uh, with those two parcels and, and determine the value of the south parcel and the north parcel. And, and it may be different, separate as opposed to conjoined. You know, the whole piece at 3.3 might be more valuable than, uh, than the individual pieces at 1.5 and 1.8, but we, we can't guess about that. Right, we could certainly get an appraisal. Um, uh, I reached out to, a, to a, a couple firms. It'll take a couple weeks to do that, um, but I agree as we as we move forward, um, the sales price, I mean, we've pushed in our conversations, but we need um, to make sure that we're comfortable with that. So if an appraisal helps us get there, we're happy to commission, we'll get it done for the next, uh, before we come back again, we'll, we'll have that finished. Right. Sure, just to affirm what our, my colleagues have said too, I think we need to make sure that whatever we do here, we need to leave room for light rail on the, on the west side of the property, including a prospective station location that Member Stewart's talked about, I think we'd be, short-sighted if we didn't do that. And I think everybody's had that in the back of their mind, and we realize these are real preliminary plans. But just to reinforce that notion that that's really an important piece of the puzzle here. And then I think for me, the other thing is, uh, I remember years ago, uh, when I first got on the city council, we were thinking about building a community center that was centralized as opposed to decentralized, and we ended up actually decentralizing activities in, in our city that we needed more gyms, uh, upgraded swimming pools. Uh, we went around on a, in a bus all, seeing all these community centers all over the metro. I think once a week we went someplace. And everywhere we went, the level of subsidy, uh, and this is many years ago now, was in that half million to $800,000 range. And I remember Gordon Hughes, our former city manager, saying the capital part is the easy part. You know, I mean, we can figure out how to do that and make it work. It's the operating, and and what the what, and I appreciate Director Catry being candid with these numbers. The, the issue I think is there is what level of subsidy are we going to be comfortable with? Uh, you know, saying that the taxpayers of the city of Edina are going to, uh, you know, be willing to support a half million dollar a year subsidy. We're already at two and a quarter, but the the, the delta there is about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars more plus the capital costs. So I think that, that's something we need to kind of talk through too as, as a group and figure out when we get some tighter numbers, uh, whether, that, whether we're prepared to do that. So those are some of my observations. And, and with that question about whether or not we're ready to proceed with the, with the community investment, that, that's a huge um, uh, decision to make, I, I agree. Um, it's also a very vital decision to make for the developer because as they make their investment, they're gonna, gonna wanna have some degree of certainty that their neighbor isn't just a dusty, vacant lot. Um, you know, so that, that's one area that we, I think we've reached a pretty good middle ground with Franchu in, in the terms that we've prepared so far, um, is that, that they've, they can um, give the city a few years to proceed, um, but at some point if, if there's not a decision 
will have to go in and, and at least clean up the rest of that site so it's presentable and it's a good neighbor. Um, uh, but, but I think as we move forward in this conversation, as we start to prepare a, a real estate contract in the months ahead, um, we want to be as certain as we possibly can that the city is ready to make this funding commitment. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big request. We're not asking that today, but that's one of the key, key points in my memo is um, I just wanted to raise it to your attention that in order to sign a, a contract with, I think, anyone, they're going to want to know what is the timeline and what is that thing next door. The other thing that you asked about, and I didn't comment on it, was I'm interested in my colleagues' thoughts on this. You wanted some guidance with respect to the HRA's willingness to consider a low-interest loan to support 10% affordable housing on the site. And I don't know what folks' thoughts are on that. Member Fisher? Well, I, I just, just looking at time and everything, I, I would say um, I just want to reach back on the other topic real quick sure. and then go to the, the uh, low-interest loan. The whole thing on the purchase price of the land, it was a bit of a light bulb moment for me that to realize that you know we've been working on this for a long time, and really just in the last couple of weeks is the first time we've been we've had a scheme that literally separates the ownership of this land. Um, so it certainly makes sense, due diligence perspective, to go out and get an appraisal on the, you know, understand the value of the land. But I would also remind everyone that. And uh, Mr. Anderson, I think, made this point that the, the value of the land is very much dependent on what you can build on the land or what you would build on the land. And uh, if I recall, the school district, when they sold their piece of property, there was more than a million dollar delta even on the proposals that they got based on what developers were going to want to build on that land. And so I think it's a real point when, when you say that one developer chose to build you know, high-end senior housing, which is just a whole different market than what's happening here. So if we were satisfied with, you know, just putting um, senior housing, um, some, with, you know, sort of, it's, it's, it's sort of a special finance element there, um, that'd be one thing. But I think what we want is uh, a different dynamic uh, on this block. So that will all have to play into to the appraisal. To, to the, the appraisal. Yeah, you know, I just think want to be careful. That's about a great that. point. Because two pieces of land Mr. aren't Anderson equal if point. they have different uses. So that point made um, my feeling on the whole um, low interest loan thing. And I know we don't have set. Uh, we 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 aren't mature enough in this process to know exactly what our policy is on this. But I've always felt like if we're going to help with the affordable housing, it should be taking from the city's policy of the 15 years and getting 30 years. That we should, we should figure out ways to help projects make sure that we have permanent affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, I just struggle all day long the idea that we're going to have affordable housing for 15 years. We've been sitting on this site for 10 years, so right now we'd be saying, "Oh, we're." <laughs> if we had started 10 years ago, we'd already be worried that we're going to lose the affordable housing on this site. So we just have to think long term on that. And and I'm I'm. I'm all in on helping make the finances work if it's for long-term or permanent affordable housing. Member Stockton. So I'd echo a lot of the comments on the land price. I think the appraisal makes sense, and I, I, um, I echo um, Commissioner Fisher's notion about the sophistication of that appraisal. We need to be thinking about what that potential use is. Um, on the affordable housing, I was going to address exactly the same point. It strikes me that if we are going to participate in the terms of a loan, and we're not granting it, so we're getting the money back, but one way for us to um, manage that as it's evolving is that in exchange, it's not just a 15-year, it's a permanent, whatever permanent ends up meaning legally. Um, then... Um, on the point that Commissioner Stewart raised, um, I think we should explore the event center piece of this. I think it's a potential. I think that increases the hub nature of this. It makes it a destination, and it might help with some of the operating costs over time as we're able to lease that out. Um, and I'd be interested in some of that. And if that's a third floor, all the better, because now you've got views that um, I thought it was really noteworthy, Mr. Pashati, when you 
talked about the potential elevations of the project, that you might have a six-story building at the bottom of the hill and the rooftop of a two-story building at the top of the hill is roughly the same. And so a third story might even be above that, which would make it an even more attractive um, space. And um, I think those are the three. I know there's one other issue, but if I think of it, I'll come back to it. Member Stewart. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of switch modes here from the question asking mode to the guidance mode, and I want to share some thoughts on a few things. Um, first of all, as a, as a philosophical matter, I think it's a bad idea to separate uh, the development of the north and south parts of this. I think it's a, I'm, I'm uh, opposed to selling uh, the south end of this parcel outright and allowing it to develop on a different schedule. I think the reason we had uh, engaged Frauenschu as a partner uh, to develop the whole site was to develop the whole site. I think if we sell off half of it or a portion of it, we lose uh, important leverage that we need to get the whole thing developed. I would like to make sure we have a plan and we have a go forward uh, before a shovel goes in the ground on any part of this site. Um, and, I, and so I think it would be a terrible mistake to sell off half of it. So that said, if, if that advice is followed, all the rest of this doesn't matter. But I'm going to go into some details on, on the rest anyway. But I think selling it off separately is a, is a bad idea. Uh, I don't, I, it's certainly not why we uh, engage Frauenschu, that why we'd be under contract with them. And, uh, and I think it's wrong to um, sort of switch gears at this stage and, and have that uh, kind of an approach um, when that has never been our intention and it's, we've never signaled that in the past. Um, so uh, a couple other points on this. The, uh, again, I'm not confident that 30,000 square feet is sufficient for our, our public space. We really want to build a vital, active uh, community space and, uh, and I think we need to think through uh, all the elements that are needed to make that happen. Um, having said that, I do think the idea of self-containing the parking on each end uh, is probably a wise idea. Um, uh, in terms of if we were to sell land, um, I don't see any reason why Fraunshu would have an exclusive on this. I think, uh, yes, a, a, an appraisal is one thing. I, I'd just have a public auction if I wanted to sell off a piece of the land, get, get the highest bidder. That tells you what the market price is. And, uh, and it also allows the market to decide what use goes into that space. I think this, uh, as they say when you study real estate law, um, every parcel is unique. And I think this um, particular site is very unique and attractive. I think it's very valuable. Uh, and I think that, that many things that it gets compared to aren't um, adequate comparables. So I, I, I would say, uh, I'm not even concerned that much about getting an appraisal. I'm, I'd be more inclined to have an auction and get uh, active bidders and, and find out what the real market value is. Um, uh, would, you, would you articulate that a little bit further or uh, go a little deeper on that? So are you, are you saying that you'd be in favor of not continuing a relationship with Fraunchu? Well, I, I don't but, see why but, they would have an exclusive right to buy the land at their price. I, that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Um, but I, I think separating it would be a terrible mistake. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to allow the south end to be developed and not have a plan, a rock-solid plan that's going forward in the north end, um, okay. I, mo most importantly. And then uh, finally, on the affordable housing, I, I endorse uh, Commissioner Fisher's view uh, regarding the affordable housing. I, I think um, you're exactly right. I, I'm also concerned about the mechanics of the um, uh, HRA being a lender. I, 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 I don't think the HRA is, is well uh, structured to be an effective uh, lender, and, and so I'm still toying with the idea of whether we can uh, team up with the Housing Foundation to... Um, sort of be our eyes and ears, act on our behalf on some of those things. But I, I don't have any concrete proposal at this time on that. But uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out 
what an appropriate role for the HRA is. I know we've got some cash available to us. I'm just trying to figure out what is the right way for us to uh, be good stewards of that, those resources and what is the right way for us to do that. The other thing I, I will say, uh, about 45 minutes ago when we were talking about financing, uh, Mr. Lindgren was leaning way forward in his chair like he had something to say. And if, if you do have advice for us, Mr. Lindgren, it's always good advice, and I'd like to invite it here. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading the body language. I, okay. Can I just jump Back in? Back to Member Stanton. Yeah, so he's a couple other points that I have remembered. One is... Um, I agree with what was said about the potential for the rail, and that is one of the seven guiding principles from the whole Grandview study that we ought to be preserving that opportunity. And so to the extent that fits in as we think through community center stuff, that makes sense. And what I will say is I like this latest iteration in the sense that the middle section is not um, developed in a sense. We're bringing in fill to raise the level to where we need it, but it could expand to parking structure in the future if it was necessary, and I think that's a really good plan. The other thing I would say with respect to the north side of the community center, I appreciate the entrance at the northeast corner, but um, if one of the advantages of that site is the potential for a Woonorf on the north side that eventually extends across, we ought to be thinking about the north side of that building in a way that invites the buildings on the other side of the street, i.e. the old Blockbuster Starbucks building, to turn around and face that eventually. And so we would want it to be an active enough space that we would, we would entice the, the structures, which I'm confident are gonna turn over at some point in the foreseeable future to turn around and face that site. Because I think as the whole district goes around you, you then create an opportunity for some parking between Vernon, you know, if Devani's were to front on Vernon or some other building were to front on Vernon and the, the Starbucks building were to front on the Woonarf, now you've got parking in between them which can serve that and you get the Woonarf across the railroad tracks. So, thanks. Good. Thanks. Um, I personally prefer this iteration uh, that you've advanced as opposed to the more complex ones that we've seen in the past. I think this is cleaner. I think it, they can be developed uh, fairly close in time. Uh, the actual idea of having Frownshoe stage in our portion of the property to do their work is better than I think having the situation we have on Eden Avenue with Trammell Crow where we're down to one small lane in each direction. So I think those, that part of it I'm comfortable with. We could coordinate it. I agree with my colleagues on the affordable housing piece of it. I, we, we, want some, uh, we want affordable housing that's permanent in nature. Uh, I joined Member Fisher, or Member, uh, uh, we got to use Member Stewart. We were using your name for the last two weeks. So I'm not going to change it to call everybody Member Fisher, Member Stewart. Uh, the role of the HRA uh, in affordable housing, uh, I think that's something that we need to visit about. Uh, I do like the idea that if there's a loan that it come from the Housing Foundation as opposed to the HRA, uh, along with that permanency that everybody seems to think is a common denominator and an important factor here. So um, I'll continue to kind of think about the, the subsidy part of it. I, I think the capital part we can solve. I think we can solve it with some philanthropy. Maybe that makes the operating deficit a little bit more comfortable. Uh, I like Member Stewart's idea of making sure that we have a public gathering space of some type. You know, when you think about where we gather folks now, it's at Braemar or it uh, seems, you know, on a smaller scale at uh, Centrum, which is uh, not a good place to really have a public gathering unless it's summertime when you can partially be outside, and then it's a beautiful place. But to have some capacity for something is uh, an important consideration, I think, for our community. Um, the other comments I won't repeat. Um, I do believe the appraisal is an important thing to get from a component standpoint. We need to be able to be comfortable with uh, a potential selling price, and I hope something works out here. But uh, let's get that appraisal. That's it for me. Anything else, um, Mr. Neuendorf? Uh, no, that's very helpful direction. So um, uh, we'll keep working. Um, the the resolution that we passed uh, in June 
to continue our relationship with Franchu extends uh, to September 30th. So we'll be back well before that deadline, but we'll, we'll get the additional information and we'll keep rolling. So thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Um, I'm wondering, Mr. Neundorf, if you want to take the time to do that project update, or we should go right into um, the tax increment financing on Pentagon Park South, and you hold that update for another time, unless you think it's important sequentially to do it now. Um, no, uh, uh, I just wanted to, pro to provide an update on all the various projects, so that's in your packet. There's really no discussion necessary. I think it's most important to, to uh, finish our conversation about the Pentagon Park project. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, then we'll let, let you move on with uh, Pentagon Park South. Super. So the, uh, the second item um, uh, is in regards to the use of tax increment financing for the Pentagon Park South property. Uh, that's, on, of course, on the south side of West 77th Street at Computer Avenue. Um, uh, several months ago, a joint venture consisting of Hillcrest Development and Solomon Real Estate uh, uh, approached us to uh, to start to implement uh, and make that transition from a from a concept to a, to a, a project. Um, they currently propose to build a two phase project on this 12 acre parcel, uh, with the intention that it be a catalytic development for that area. Uh, this is the parcel of land that's been vacant. The uh, the developer was able to demo that back in 2015. So this proposal was approved um, through the planning. Planning Commission through the City Council uh, in early June. It consists of two retail buildings, two <coughs> hotels, uh, a public plaza, uh, as well as site improvements over the entire property. Phase two would, would come a little bit later. That would consist of uh, two office buildings and an office retail mixed use building. Uh, phase two, however, is uh, conditioned uh, on the appetite of the marketplace. So the, uh, the preliminary zoning approvals that have been given for, for phase two would allow them to change some of those specific elements when, uh, to, to actually bear to the market conditions. Um, uh, but overall, this project is, is estimated to cost uh, more than $140 million. Uh, so that's quite a significant investment. Um, the developer has requested uh, an 18.1 million pay-as-you-go TIF note to support the overall development. And in recent uh, weeks and months, we've had lots of conversation about this project and, and the uh, tax increment financing for it. Um, uh, uh, based on the direction that was given uh, to us from this group over the last several weeks, uh, based on input from our legal advisors, from our finance advisors, um, uh, we believe that we've reached agreeable terms with the developer for this project. Um, uh, the, the content of the, uh, of the proposal uh, would satisfy the financial needs of the project, um, which are very high, while also retaining a high standard for the use of tax increment financing in Edina. Um, so with, the, uh, with that, I'll run through a couple of the, of the basic uh, elements here, uh, and this is also uh, in the packet, uh, the recommended TIF participation. Um, so the TIF amount of 18.1 million uh, would, would not be one lump sum, it would be a pay-as-you-go type of, type of investment. So as the developer builds on the property, starts paying taxes, some of those taxes would be returned to him to pay off that $18.1 million pledge. We would actually issue three notes rather than one, recognizing that, that this proposal is, is phased in nature. So the first note would be, uh, would be uh, priced at about $9 million, and that's basically to get the whole site prepped. Uh, the stormwater, the soil work, the, the curbs, the gutters, um, all the things that are frankly missing there today. Um, they would construct, as part of this, the first two retail buildings. Um, and it's their intention uh, to also pull the trigger on one of the hotels in this first element. Um, in, in case the timing of that doesn't work out though, um, we had a lot of discussion about a minimum assessment agreement to make sure that we're compliant with the state uh, TIF statutes. Uh, uh, after additional conversation, the developer is agreeable uh, to that minimum assessment agreement. Um, I do want to reiterate that that's, that's plan B. Plan A is to build the project, but just in case there's a hiccup in the timing, we do have a, a backup plan. Um, the second TIF note uh, uh, 
is priced at $5.4 million. That was the level recommended by staff and our, and our advisors. Um, and that would be uh, uh, to help the developer pay for a, a parking structure that's estimated to cost around $10 million. It's that parking structure that enables this more intensive use of office, hotel, retail, et cetera, on that property. Um, so the second TIF note would help the developer to pay for that. Um, in exchange, he would uh, 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 issue a public easement so that anyone could use that parking ramp, whether you're uh, on the property, whether you're across the property, whether you're going to the Fred Richards Park. Um, and then the third installment would be the uh, TIF note uh, priced at $3.7 million. And that one is a little bit longer term in nature where it essentially uh, incentivizes the developer to get more of these great elements in place sooner. So if they can do that, if they can sign the hotels, if they can get the, the other elements going, and if they can get started on the second phase, currently uh, anticipated to be office space, when they get started on that second phase, then this third TIF note kicks in. So those were, um, uh, those were some big discussion points in our, very, in our recent meetings and uh, the developer and staff and our advisors are in agreement on that. Um, the second primary issue is um, installation of public improvements on West 77th Street. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last, uh, at our last meeting, um, but that those terms are also agreeable to staff. Um, uh, we will um, make sure that there are contractual provisions that protect the city's interests so that the investments that the city makes to fix the roads are guaranteed to be paid for by the developer. If not, they would be in default and they would risk losing their TIF notes. So we'll make sure that those uh, issues are coordinated. Um, but a after a lot of conversation, both uh, uh, with this group and with the negotiating team, uh, staff uh, does recommend that the HRA uh, approve these general terms and conditions. Um, we further recommend that you authorize uh, our staff as well as our advisors to, to complete these financial negotiations and prepare a full and complete TIF redevelopment agreement that would be brought, brought to you in the near future. Um, I, I saw that Mr. Tankinoff with Hillcrest Development is also in the, in the room. If you have any questions for uh, myself, for, our, uh, uh, for the HRA's team, or for the developer, they are here as well. We look forward to your, uh, uh, to your action this morning. Member Short. I have uh, some questions for Mr. Anhut. So uh, last time we reviewed this, I was still stuck on the idea that the appropriate level of TIF support for this would be about 14 and change million. Um, now we were talking about 18 million. I, to me, it seemed that dividing the uh, TIF into three pieces and, and uh, uh, only sort of providing a stage gate payment of those. Uh, to me, that did not justify a, a almost $4 million delta in, uh, in additional risk to the city. So uh, please help me understand why that's now uh, the recommendation. Our recommendation is based on the developer's request that they would need an $18 million note of assistance for this project. Uh, we are, we do share the concern. We, our projections uh, show that given the elements that are prescribed and as part of their plan, we expect a generation of about $14.5 million over the term of this TIF district. It would be a pay-as-you-go note, so that risk falls to the developer to actually build the project that creates the incremental taxes to repay that obligation. They're asking to capture a little bit above that to include some inflationary aspects to the value of these properties over time. My uh, $14 million estimate is based more on a straight-line approach given the elements that are proposed today. Uh, I can say that we are trying to mitigate that by imposing some conditions so that the that delta that you referenced that uh, additional 3.6 million would only kick in when they actually do bring some of those elements uh, to substantiate the uh, full build out of the site uh, but it is over and above uh, my estimate of the expectation of the tip district in this term you should be aware that even at a 14 million dollar size it's our expectation that it will use the entire life of the tip district 
to uh, repay that obligation. So ramping it up to the 18 only, it doesn't extend the amount of time that you would be assisting this project in the life of the TIF district. It only um, further solidifies that there, there should be no expectation in your mind that you would be able to shut this district down any earlier. But that's, that's precisely where I'm stuck. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I, will, I don't know if I'm hidebound and wanting to take the more traditional approach, um, but it, it, uh, I'm troubled by uh, the additional risk. And I, I feel that as good stewards of these resources on behalf of the city, I, I'm not comfortable with the additional risk of the increased TIF. I'm, and I'm uh, and I don't feel that, that the, uh, the pay-as-you-go structure mitigates sufficiently that risk. Am I wrong? I, I, somebody needs to convince me because I'm, I'm still not there. I don't, I don't think that you are wrong. I think it's just a, a, an expectation that um, given the terms of the agreement today, if the value of the property were to appreciate and you only had a $14 million obligation, there would be some opportunity later on in the life of the district that you could terminate it earlier, return it to the tax rolls, and uh, bring it on to help uh, mitigate some other operational costs that you have in the city as well as the school district and the county. Um, I think that is the, the risk that we are talking about uh, today by ramping it up and allowing for that appreciation to kind of include that within the calculation for what could be available <coughs> over time, you really are shutting that door, uh, so to speak. I think your expectation should be that if the project appreciates, if, if it does follow through with the developer's plan of action, if, if there is some uh, increase in value that's created over and above what we see in the marketplace today, that will not benefit the ability to shut the TIF district down early, it would, it would only allow them to make a more substantial investment today to deliver these elements uh, that they are proposing. But, but even if we only extend the $9 million and then shut it down, the benefit we're getting for the $9 million is a lot less than uh, what I would want uh, for a $9 million TIF. Right. So, so I'm still stuck in this issue of risk and of, of what is appropriate risk on behalf of the city. And my function as a person who has to either approve or, or disapprove of the taking of that risk, I'm, I'm still not in a place where I think it's appropriate for us to take that risk. And that's, that's um, I, I, and I'm not hearing anything that convinces me otherwise so far. I don't think I can, I can give you a, uh, any better perspective on that risk element. I think we've, we've talked about some of the parameters that are in place, the timelines, uh, as far as using this tool and the ability to uh, maximize it today. I think the developers operating under, under those as well, they understand they're going to have to make some substantial upfront expenditures that may not normally happen if on a normal market rate project where we didn't have these five-year deadlines uh, coming before us. And so in part of their discussions and, and discussing their risks, they've requested uh, the ability to compartmentalize these TIF, to bring these elements on in a phased order of magnitude, not all up front today. Um, and we, we've allowed for that, but we want some, some caveats in there that before public expenditures are going to be made on these TIF notes that they have to actually deliver building elements that are going to substantiate them. I don't uh, necessarily provide that as any uh, counter argument to your claim on the $9 million note. I think, I think you have surmised the situation. We're just working within that five-year barrier, and this is, I guess, the best course of action that we can put forward today, given their needs. Yeah, I, I, and the five-year barrier, I, I, that's not my problem. I, that we didn't create that problem. We shouldn't be held hostage by it. I, uh, that's not something that motivates me at all. So. What's the role? Last time you were here, the thing I remember that we got caught up in the minimum assessment agreement. The developer didn't want to do it. We thought that was a method or a backup plan to mitigate the risk. And so we haven't talked about that in the context of having this conversation with Member Stewart. What's the, what's the, what's the role of the minimum assessment agreement now that they're willing to enter into? So it will provide you the ability to defend 
uh, statement that the HRA has made uh, to date that any use of tax increment is going to be used to provide uh, an increase in market value over and above what could otherwise be achieved on the site without the public expenditure. Um, so part of this conversation, one of the, one of the things that you know, we wanted to be clear is that if there was going to be an initial note before any payment is made on that note, the developer needs to demonstrate that there's at least been a commensurate increase in value on the site, whether regardless of the expenditures that they're making, that there is actually a taxable market value increase on the site. The minimum assessment agreement was a mechanism to ensure that. It would be our preference, and I think the developers as well, that they're able to bring these elements on in a, in a more rapid fashion. And, and bringing these buildings forward would, would far exceed what would be achieved by the minimum assessment. Right. That, that is purely a backstop, right. if you will. If, and if there's a failure, the minimum assessment agreement's only good if they're solvent. Uh, and, and so uh, if there's a failure, the whole thing's going to be flipped on its head. And I think the minimum assessment agreement doesn't provide you much security when things aren't working. Member Fisher? I guess I would like somebody to explain it. I don't know if it's Jay, your deal, or if it's Nick, if it's yours, but um, we talk about additional risk that the city's taking on. And I, I understand we have term risk, like it's the term of the TIF district. And that's, you know, that's a risk. It's, it's, or it's just a known issue. Um, but what I'd like somebody to explain to me, as we sit here, what are the bad things that can happen to the city by doing this $18.1 million TIF over time? Because as I'm looking at it, we're not, there's no money being, uh, no money's going to the developer until they've expended it, they've built what they're supposed to build. We're, through this methodology, we're, we're in, in some ways intensifying the development sooner rather than later. We're incentivizing getting the stuff built and, and up. It, and, and so maybe I'm just missing something to, to Commissioner Stewart's point. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding um, what is what does risk look like for us and, and how is it higher with this scenario than it might be if we're talking $4 million less in overall authorized TIF expenditures. Am I being clear in terms of how I'm asking that? And Mr. Chair, if I can take yeah. a run at that. That's why I was trying to pop up, because I wanted to really, I think with you, Commissioner Stewart, sort of engage in the discussion about risk. Because I start with the very basic premise that this is a pay-go TIF note. So from a pure risk standpoint, the risk to the city is very low. I mean, this is a question of sizing of the note, whether or not a private developer that has access to that note can go out and place the note and capitalize it sufficiently, and whether that's 14 or 18 million, however it's come together, that's all risk that falls on the developer. So I don't see that creating any financial risk to the city. Again, I think Nick did a good job of explaining the, the first risk of sort of potentially oversizing a note like that is that it might take the full length of the district. Even that in itself isn't a risk to the city. It's a question that you might not be able to make a decision in pick a period, 20 years, to end the district early and then release that money for other purposes. You know, so that there, there's something there that's maybe not the most conservative approach, but I don't really view it as a risk. I think the reason then to get more to Commissioner Fisher's question is that we came up with the structure that we did because it's 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 unusual the way to have these three kind of notes being structured the way it is. But I think it's, A, it's legal for all the reasons we talked about, the minimum assessment giving you the basis to find the but for finding. I think that's a very strong, positive point. The second thing is with phasing of this, I mean, the other way you look at it is it's kind of a $9 million note because the goal here in creating this southern gateway is to build all of it. 
what you're really doing, I think, to the risk question is you're making a decision now, if you want to do this, to issue a $9 million note that gets you two retail buildings and a plaza and that base infrastructure that might create the future Southern Gateway. If I was sitting in your seat, that's the decision really in my mind, is do you want to have a situation that's legal, that the but for can be fined, that you'll issue an initial $9 million note that will at least get it started? And then these other things have to be built in order to get to the $18 million. Again, my personal opinion, I think we've structured something that mitigates that as well as we can realizing that we are operating within the five-year window. And I don't want to disagree with you, but the five-year issue is one that's been thrust upon us, and it's our collective issue, because either, either this deal will get put together and be done in time that that July 2019 deadline will happen, or we're back into the market scenario, and if something hasn't happened, for low these many years, how likely is that southern gateway to come up? You know, so I, that's a bit of a rambling explanation, but you know, I don't know that I've fully addressed your question of risk. But I mean, there, this is not an extraordinary TIF deal, in my opinion. It's a little unusual. It's structured a little unusual. The use of the minimum assessment agreement. I don't think I've really done it like exactly for this purpose before, but. I think it all works. Does that help? Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Linger, weren't there also uh, two hotel elements in that first phase? You, you mentioned two retail buildings and a plaza. I thought in phase one there were also uh, hotels. No, B is two. But they don't. But the, they're not conditioned. They're not conditioned to issuance of the note. Right. The, okay. The, um, that's, the, that's the distinction. The phase construction of the project is a little bit different than the phased note delivery. All right. They, they're, they're not, uh, they don't coincide precisely. If, if all goes well, they will coincide perfectly. But yeah. real estate, you know, there's six different real estate deals on this one site. And so the developer has asked, asked for a little bit more flexibility in case the schedule on one or two of them isn't perfect. Uh, we all hope it is. They're working hard to do it. Um, uh, uh, I mean, ultimately, they uh, in the next 12 months, they will be making uh, uh, investments of tens of millions of dollars into a site. So they are working hard to make sure that those other real estate transactions do occur on, on the time frame. Uh, it, speaking of risk, I think it's the developer's money that's truly at risk. I mean, they're, they're ready to prepare or they're ready to go into the ground starting in the next couple months. Um, and that's their money at risk. Um, we think it's a wise risk. It's a great location, great opportunity. They've got the approved plans. Um, so again, that's that's uh, as we've as we've discussed risk amongst our negotiating team. Uh, we feel that again. <coughs> I think Mr. Lindgren had mentioned this. This is definitely an unusual deal. I don't know if I would ever. I don't think I've ever done one like this in the past. I don't know if I'd want to do one that's as messy as this one. Um, but it works. We, we feel that it works. So that's why we're here this morning. Yeah, I thought you'd made a good explanation. No, you were worried about your explanation. It was good. Members, Member Stanton. So, not to beat this risk horse to death, but I, I think for folks who might be watching or listening, the, the pay-as-you-go is the critical piece to the risk mitigation. That if we were going to, as a city, act as the financing agent by borrowing money and then giving it to the developer, and then the increment that came in would repay our note, then there'd be risk. Because if the increment didn't show up, we would have to go to, go to the taxpayers to pay back that bond. That's not what we're doing, so I don't really see it as risk. I think the bigger issue is there, you know, it's a subsidy that basically says that this property can't be redeveloped without us providing $18 million worth of um, city, school district, and county tax revenues over the course of the 25 year period. And I just don't buy it. And I don't see what we get in return for that. We're not doing anything with 77th Street. Anything we are doing with 77th Street is just going to be assessed, so it's outside of the TIF. 
um, I don't see any connection to the you know to the overall plan of public realm development along the 77th Street corridor. I see parking that is off the off the trail and basically used to support the private uses on the site. And I I think if we are going to approve the use of TIF here, the question I'd ask is when are we not going to approve the use of TIF? Because it seems to me that this is a this is supposed to be one of the prime sites in the region and the applicant is basically telling us they can't redevelop this site without help and I just I just don't believe it. So I'm not supportive of proceeding. Member Fisher, any comment? Well, I guess, you know, I'm I'm looking at our our team, um, you know, this whole but for test is a really important test. And I'm, you know, I'm relying on, uh, you know, we're going to need to make that but for argument. And, and maybe, maybe to Commissioner Staunton's question, could we get a little bit more explanation on that piece? I mean, do we, I, I don't see it quite as black and white as Commissioner Staunton. I, I do think there are public benefits here. Um, I think it gets a little... And we haven't talked a lot about this, but I, like I struggle with the, you know, the parking is an eligible expense. But if we believe that the parking is truly only going to be for hotel and office, then you like, well, well, then why? What's the public benefit? Now, truly, the parking's available. I, I'm sort of looking toward the longer term future, and I'm looking at parking that's sitting below two hotel properties, for example. And I'm, I'm looking at a location on our freeway system with an exit and a looping road around the development. And I'm saying, I believe long term, this is, this is transit oriented development. I think this is a bus looping down the freeway to downtown kind of location. And as hotel customers are leaving and transit users are coming, it's a perfect use for you know, a, a publicly accessible parking structure. Now, we haven't gotten into those details in, in all of this conversation, and, and maybe I'm just imagining things, but I just want to make sure that from the perspective of our consultants who do this every day, that we're not running a field of, you know, off, off you know, what would be a legitimate but-for test and, and, you know, why you would use TIF. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, um I think there's kind of two conversations going on here. And Commissioner Staunton, I won't engage because it's not my job on any of the things that you said. Those are all legitimate questions that you as the elected officials need to decide. To your narrow point, if I will, about what's unique about the but for finding. I mean, the but for finding has the larger elements of what you're talking about about is this the thing you want to do that's subjective to you and you know you make those decisions how you make those decisions the piece that i think that what we've proposed satisfies is the mechanical element that in essence when the new thing is built that does that develops increment it has to have an increase in the taxable value equal to the amount of the increment I used a lot of words to say that, but for the first thing, what we're really talking about, and that's why I think it's important to note that, yes, they want to build it all, and they want to build it all and get started on it in the next year, but what they're promising for a $9 million note is to build two retail buildings and some plaza and some other infrastructure. So in some ways, that's what you're getting. And what the minimum assessment does is that in and of itself might not lead to $9 million worth of new tax valuation. So by having a minimum assessment agreement, we say, well, until it naturally reaches $9 million, you agree that there will be taxes equal to that increase in value, which I think checks off the box for that part of the but for finding. Does that Can I help I mean well, it, that's, it helps, that's one that's just the legal narrow piece it's not the policy piece which and, and maybe you can clarify so that. and I think this is a really important discussion because there are these two conversations one is the legal and the other is the policy 
And on the legal, I have no doubt, the, the legal test, as I understand it, is but for the use of TIF, this project would not be possible. Not that any project would not be possible, right? We could probably just debate that, but right. th that's a fair, I mean, and we're so making the a question, decision about this project. Right? right, and the question, so I, I don't have a quarrel with the fact that we can satisfy the legal test about whether there's a but-for finding to be made here. My quarrel is with the policy choice of deciding to invest in, in this project because of the, the particular dimensions of this project. That's the point I'm making. So it's got to be done regardless. Member Stewart, any <laughs> thoughts? No, the, the things that uh, Commissioner Staunton uh, did not mention when you listed the things that you weren't sure fit the policy did include the uh, uh, it's a difficult soils so to, to prepare these soils and as uh, Commissioner Fisher I think you've mentioned in the past the idea was to um, sort of equalize the, the playing field relative to a greenfield development further out in the suburbs and I think that that so, so for some of those things the soil preparation for putting the significant structures on top the uh, the plaza uh, some of those things are I think appropriate uh, public uses but I, I agree the parking is that's a difficult argument and I think in our last yeah. conversation we got to around I don't know 1.2 million dollars or 1.7 right. million dollars when you take the plaza and the roads and I mean I just yeah uh, for me, and, and I appreciate and uh, understand well uh, Commissioner Staunton's view on um, public purpose, I guess is the way I would put it in a attenuated sort of fashion. I think the property could be developed. I think it depends on what we want to see there. If we want to maximize that, as you characterize it, Mr. Lindgren, our southern gateway, do we want to, what, what kind of development we, do we want to see there? Uh, I think there's a distinct public purpose in looking at the big picture and saying, yeah, we want to maximize that southern gateway. And I think uh, our developer, Mr. Scott, has come up with some wonderful ideas here. On that, on that first note, the nine million, over half of it is just on soils remediation, which I think, you know, we need to face up to that. We might have to help somebody with that regardless. So for me personally to see the kind of development that we can potentially see there i think this is essential that we we use tiff in this circumstance for its statutorily permitted purposes so from a public policy standpoint i take a, a broader sort of view of of the public purpose here to get us the kind of development we want as opposed to not assisting with tiff and seeing some development there because it is a good piece of property but not maximizing the potential of that that particular property. That's that's kind of my view of it. So I, 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 I'm comfortable with the explanations you've given on the 18.1 million. I think you know, we've heard your 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 reservations in the past, and now you are here as a team, saying we can make this work. You know, we're we're comfortable enough to stand in front of you and say this is what our staff and our advisors recommend. And so I'm in favor of uh, advancing it and. Uh, I think if Member Brindle was here, she'd say the same thing based on her past comments. So I don't know if that caused anybody else to make any further comment. Um, and we're past 9.30. <laughs> so you wanted a motion. Do you want to wait till that we have a full complement of people here? Or what, what do you want to do? Uh, we are rapidly reaching the timeline where decisions have to be made. So um, uh, um, I think it, it would be best if we had the full complement of the board here this morning to have the conversation. Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, the assembled team is is standing behind these these deal points. Um, uh, uh, they're messy, um, but uh, if a little bit more time is, is helpful, I think we could probably do that. 
Um, Mr. Tankanoff is here, and he could probably best answer that question about whether or not he needs, needs an answer today or if he needs an answer in two weeks. Perhaps he could comment. Okay. You will get an answer in two weeks. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, um, again, thank you for your time. A two-week delay is, I understand you don't have the full complement, is difficult because we have real development things that we need to get going on schedule-wise. I think to a couple of the points that I've heard from commissioners, the will there be development there if this is not passed? I think there will be. What will it be? It will not be the vision that we've all worked on for the last 12 plus months that we've all met on as a group, individually with staff, and I think that that's really the question. Um, Member Staunton brought up the question of, you know, what would this be without TIF? And I can't say what it would be, except it would be an MDD6 type use, and it's not going to be as additive or as beneficial, and the vision's not going to be between Highway 100 and France Avenue of being great. This is a stage, when we've talked about a staged project, it's candidly being cautious and being pragmatic. It's not leading you to believe that all of the elements can be achieved in the next 12 months. We're trying to not mislead you. In fact, we're trying to be brutally honest about it. And that's why I feel this note has been broken into three pieces. It's about being direct and honest and not coming back and saying, gee, we tried and it doesn't work. We're trying to make sure it works. This is a property, back to Commissioner Staunton's comment, maybe something works here without TIF. This property is a challenged property. It is not a simple property. This is not France Avenue, and it's not a lot of other places, whether in Edina or elsewhere. This particular property has been blighted for 20 plus years. When I was a kid, a skinnier kid, back in the day when I got in real estate, I remember driving by Pentagon Park, and it was 30 some years ago. And it was okay. But for the last 20 plus years, this has been a blighted, challenged property. We've torn down the building that's there. It's really a question of, is the vision that we've all worked on of doing more than stabilization, is that what's desirable? The chance for greatness. That's really the question that I think is before us. Um, we just, the, the timing part of it of the five years, Commissioner Stewart, you're right. That's not really the city's issue. But that's been in front of the city for the last four years, and it's been in front of us, and we have done everything we can to get there. And, and that's where we're really at the point where this is the chance to make this property great. Not just whatever it could be, but great. And that's what we're all trying to do. The financial risk should be on the developer. And not only do I believe it is, but the, I believe the consultants are saying it is, and that's what's appropriate. So all I can ask is, we really need to move this thing forward or it needs to be put down. <coughs> Can we wait two more weeks? We're gonna lose two weeks in the drafting of the contract by your staff, that's not helpful. There are users, there are hotel users and if, if that first hotel user and second hotel user are, are going forward and they've got their purchase agreements right now, they do, then a lot of that risk of, gee, is it just a couple of retail buildings, the plaza, and the chance for greatness, that's mitigated. But we're not sending a good signal here. And I think that's maybe my closing comment is the best signal we can send is this project makes sense. Let's move forward. We're going forward together. Is it perfect? It's not perfect. Is this what we wanted? Um, Mr. Scott, myself, Mark Ronhorst? No, not really. It's not what we wanted. But it is the very best we can do. So I, I guess I'd ask if, if there's a way to move this forward, I think we should. If not, it's not life and death. It's not flesh and blood. We're all going to survive, but I think this is the best thing to do. Um, Manager Neal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm in agreement with Mr. Tankinoff on this one. I, I think in terms of, of how the HRA uh, and the council function going forward, uh, adopting a, an operating practice where you only uh, uh, vote on issues if they're all present, I think is problematic for how we uh, interact with uh, projects coming toward you. So I would encourage you to, to act today um, if you're of a mind to. 
All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve the terms negotiated with the developers and authorization to prepare a full tax increment financing agreement for the Pentagon Park South project um, as recommended by staff and our advisors? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Member Stewart? Yeah, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to support this not because of, um, well, really because of my great confidence in our staff and our advisors. I, I think our team does a fantastic job. I've said that before when uh, we talked about uh, them negotiating versus us negotiating from the dais. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to back our team on this, and I'm going to support it. Thank you. And I, and I would just say my I will not support it um, for the reasons that I've described. But that is not a commentary on our staff or, or our team. I think they've negotiated the deal, and I'm not concerned about the risk issues. What I'm concerned about is the policy choice we're making in investing in this, and it basically says that there isn't a circumstance where we won't invest, and so I will vote against it. Okay. Um, Member Fisher? Yeah, and I have complete respect for Commissioner Staunton's approach on this, um, but I, I think in totality, in what we've been doing for the last, I don't know how many months, um, to get to this place, I feel like, um, I, I mean, I have, I have so much trust in our team and the consultants and, the, and everyone that's put this together that um, while, while it might not be well, I think Mr. Tankinoff kind of hit it. It might not be what I dreamt of, but I think it's a really good solution here. And and we've, we've, we're taking all these elements and somehow making it work. And uh, I believe it, it meets enough of the test for me that it makes sense to move forward. Right, good. Um, I won't engage in any redundancies. I support it as well. Um, with uh, utmost respect for Member Staunton's policy position. So we got a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Carried. Um, anything else you want to cover, Mr. Noondorf? Otherwise, we're going to go to the day job. I think we covered it all. Thank you very much. All right. Stand adjourned. <laughs>